our Lottie Moon goal is $4,000, and, you know, I placed it there before I preached because I think it's important. Uh, every dollar that you give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering goes to fund missions like that, okay? So, uh, man, I'd ask for you to dig deeply into your pockets and give to the Lottie Moon Mission Offering this Christmas. Uh, just, a, just a grand thing. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and make your way to Hebrews chapter 2. It's obviously a place we hadn't been, right? Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, I hope I said last week we're going to be taking a break from our Journey Through Acts series just to talk about Christmas, which is obviously important this time of year. <laughs> and I'll be preaching Christmas from four maybe unusual places or four places that aren't found in the Gospels. So these are going to be four sermons you probably wouldn't normally hear at a Christmas service, but the Christmas story is there nonetheless. And we'll be looking at Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15, 1 Timothy 2, verses 12 through 17, 1 John 3, verses 1 through 10, and a more familiar Christmas passage, Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 7. But today we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. And I want to discuss from that text, so we have a very narrow focus, okay? in all four of these sermons, but I want to discuss from that text four reasons for Christmas, okay? Now, the theme of Hebrews is really the unequaled supremacy of God's Son. I'm sure you know that if you've ever read a single note in a study Bible in the book of Hebrews. The text is clear to show us that Jesus is superior to angels. Jesus is superior to the Mosaic law. Therefore, the covenant that Jesus inaugurated through his blood is superior to any covenants that preceded it. Jesus' priesthood, as you heard today, is superior to Levi's. His sacrifice was superior to all of the sacrifices before him. In fact, all of the sacrifices that took place under the Mosaic Code we're pointing toward the final perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And if you read through the book of Hebrews, you see this powerful position of Christ thrust forward when the author warns its readers not to walk away from the Christian faith. So there are some very important warning passages that we won't get to during this study, but if you want to write this down, those warning passages are found in Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through chapter 4 and verse 11. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning with verse 11 and going down through chapter 6 and verse 12. Hebrews chapter 9, excuse me, chapter 10, verses 19 through 39. And finally, chapter 12, beginning with verse 1 and going down through chapter 13 and verse, verse 17. So those warning passages are really pointing us to the supremacy of Christ and the Christian faith. And the author is saying, don't walk away from that. Now, the context of the passage that I've drawn out for today's sermon is talking about Jesus being the founder, or if you prefer, pioneer of our salvation. The author shows us how Jesus' human nature enabled him to enter into and identify with our suffering, to conquer death on our behalf, and to open up a way for us to receive the glory that God created us to receive. So, we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, and I want to show you four reasons for Christmas. So here's the text today. Uh, we might finish on time because we only have two verses, right? So that's where we're headed today, finishing on time and preaching the Christmas message. Okay, here's the text. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, that is Jesus, partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Let's pray. Father, uh, really some amazing words, some compact words, theologically 
first words, but very important words nonetheless. Father, as we come here today, it is my prayer that the hustle and bustle of Christmas won't confuse us. It's my prayer that you'll give us time even now to pause and see what this season is really all about. This season is all about Jesus Christ coming to die so that we might have life. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll prepare our hearts for that. I pray that you'll give us this desire to give toward that mission. I pray that you'll give us a desire to speak toward that mission to every single person that we come into contact with. What is that? It's this. Jesus came, was born, went to the cross. He died. He was resurrected from the grave to give us life eternal. Father, help us to spread that good news this Christmas season. Father, I need your help with this text. I need your help to get words out. And so, Father, since it's really clear that we can't do anything without you, I pray now for your help. It's in Christ's name that we pray. It's by his spirit that we live. Amen. So then, if you take notes, four reasons for Christmas from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Reason number one, we're human, if you write this down. Reason number two, so that Christ could die. Reason number three, so that Christ might destroy the devil. And reason number four, so that Christ could deliver us from slavery to the fear of death. So I want to just take those one at a time, okay, and look at the reason for Christmas from the book of Hebrews. So reason number one for Christmas is basically because we are human. Look at the text again. Since therefore... The children share in flesh and blood. He himself likewise partook of the same things. The children there in that text, obviously referring to the children of God, or really in the context, the children of Christ. So the children are flesh and blood. That's what the text is saying. Therefore, Jesus partook of the same things. What is that? Flesh and blood. What does that mean? He became human. You'll see the word thrown around during Christmas incarnate often. It's a Latin word and really the meaning is in the flesh. So this is simply saying that Jesus became human. John 1.14 says the word became flesh. That is Jesus became flesh. And dwelt among us. Philippians 2 7 says that Jesus took the form of a servant and that he was born in the likeness of men. Then verse 8 says he was found in human form. So why Christmas? Well, because we're human. Jesus became human, but why? Well, I'm about to show you reason number two for Christmas so that he could die. Okay, listen to the text carefully again. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise partook of the same things. Here it is, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. So in order to die, Jesus had to become human. Doesn't that make sense? Jesus had to be born so that he could die. Die. Think about something else very important. The purpose of the incarnation was so that Jesus could die. This wasn't an afterthought on God's part. God wasn't looking down and saying, look at my creation and look at how it's spiraling out of control. What am I going to do now? Oh, I'll send Jesus. He'll become man. He'll die and he'll make all those problems go away. No, this is plan A. God planned this in eternity past. So when God planned your salvation, He sovereignly decided that it would take the death of His Son to achieve that. And His Son, in order to die, had to become human. And that's what's going on Christmas. Jesus had to be born to die. Reason number two for Christmas. Reason number three, so that so that he, so that who, so that Jesus, I hope y'all are getting this because this is so different than what you see on TV and in the mall. 
and on the internet and on Black Friday and on Cyber Monday and all the rest. <laughs> this is telling a very important salvific message. A message that I hope that every person in this room has responded to positively. Jesus was born so that he could destroy, the text says, the devil. Look at it again. That through death, Jesus might destroy the one who has the power of death. Who is that? Who has the power of death? The text says it's the devil. You see that. So the devil is evidently very powerful. He is a force to be reckoned with. The death of Christ would destroy or nullify then the devil's power of death. Christ became human so that through his death he might literally destroy the devil. <laughs> Satan has one thing over man. You know what that is? Death. Satan has that hanging over our head. And he knows that if he can keep man sinning long enough, it's all over for man. He knows that the wages of sin is death. Satan knows that if he can keep you in his sway long enough, when you die, you're doomed and you'll be headed for hell because God has decreed from eternity past that salvation would take place in this life, not in the next. And so if Satan can keep you on the fringes of Christianity, if he can keep you dabbling in sin just a little bit, just enough to keep you from believing in Jesus and getting involved in a local church with all those weirdos, if he can just keep you there, if he can just keep you hanging in and hanging on by giving you all this good-looking stuff, how many of you can testify that sin is always wrapped in a beautiful package? It makes me feel good. She makes me feel good. He makes me feel good. It makes me feel good. So I just keep doing it, and I keep doing it, and I keep doing it. If Satan can get you to keep doing that until you draw your breath, he's got you. And you'll be doomed. Because God ain't going to save you when you die. Now right there's a mis sort of calculation by a certain church that says you might go to purgatory and you might be prayed out of purgatory into heaven. If you want to take that chance, you're walking on dangerous, and thin, and non-biblical ground. Salvation takes place in this life, not the next. So somebody had to break this power of death. And that somebody had to be a man. Some man had to conquer death and destroy Satan's powerful weapon that is death. And that man is Jesus Christ. That's what the text is saying to us. And in order for Jesus to destroy death, Jesus had to die and then rise again. And that's exactly what Jesus said, did. Therefore, John 9, 14, 19 says, Because I live, you also will live. That's the message of Christmas. Jesus came, He died, and He was resurrected, and therefore that means that you can go the way of Jesus and have life eternal. You simply trust in Him. Christ became human. The text says, so that He could die and destroy the devil and His power over death. And He simply did that through dying and rising again. And He's left that trail open for you. The only thing you have to do is believe in Him. That's the story of Christmas. Jesus made that way possible for you. Why? Because death has been conquered. The victory has been won. Paul said death is swallowed up in victory. Oh death, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? There is no victory. That's Paul's point. There is no sting. In Christ, we do not experience death the way Satan wants us to. Our death in this life is our passageway to the next. So it's almost like we're not even experiencing death because the moment we leave here, we're in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a good thing. So why Christmas then? Number one, because we're human. Number two, so that Christ could die. Number three, so that Christ could destroy the devil and his power. And reason number four, so that he could deliver us from slavery to the fear of death. 
So the author is presupposing that people are scared to die. Right? That's what he's doing. I know some people will, uh, without thinking, say, I'm not scared to die, even if you're a Christian. And I don't really think that's true. <laughs> not being ugly. I mean, I, I think that if Blue Oyster Cult knows that death is scary, we should know, right? Don't fear the reaper. They didn't write that song so that it could be played on the Jumbotron in Stark Vegas. They wrote that song because there's a general idea in society that most people are really scared of death. And I'm not really sure why that is. Uh, maybe it's the fear of the unknown. I don't know. Maybe it's the fear of leaving loved ones behind. I don't know. Maybe it's the fear of leaving unfinished business, of not being able to see your daughter walk down the aisle, of not being able to see her deliver your first grandchild, of not being able to spend 50 more years of marriage with your spouse. Maybe you're scared because you're not going to be able to ride eight seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. I don't know. But most people are scared of death. But listen to the text carefully. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So Jesus delivers believers from this lifelong grip, this lifelong slavery to the fear. To the fear of death. So death is not the same thing for believers and unbelievers. It's the most important statement I've said this morning. Death is not the same thing for believers and unbelievers. You know what? The parable of the rich man and Lazarus teaches us a very important principle. If you want to turn there, you might have time to get there. It's Luke 16. And it starts with verse 22. Maybe you could just make a note of it. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried and in Hades, being in torment. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. So the poor man died and was carried by an angel to the father of the Jewish people's side, who is Abraham. And it was a serene, peaceful, populated, evidently, place of rest. And so all of those believers who had gone on before him was already there, and they were having a party, essentially. <laughs> the rich man, on the other hand, died and went to Hades, and he was in torment. Now, Hades is a place of the wicked. In the Old Testament, it's the place of the dead. It's sort of an intermediate place whereby these dead folks, these lost folks, are waiting on their final judgment. And before the great white throne happens in their final judgment, God's going to resurrect them and give them a body that's going to be tormented for all of eternity. And when folks die, believers and unbelievers, they have a conscious awareness of their eternal state. And they either go immediately into a place of blessing or a place of suffering. <laughs> Jesus' death and resurrection guarantees all believers a place of blessing when they draw their last breath. Therefore, we have been delivered from this lifelong slavery through the fear of death. You don't have to be afraid. Because when you check out of here, you're going to see Jesus. Friends, have you ever thought of Christmas like that? I'm just asking. I never really have until I started studying this. Paul uh, says a word uh, similar to this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and following, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus God will bring us with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. 
For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Here's why I read this. And so we'll always be with the Lord. Friends, you cannot be separated from Jesus Christ the moment you say yes to Him. And it doesn't matter if it's tribulation or turmoil or bad circumstances in this life. There is nothing that can separate you from Christ. That's how powerful His blood is. And that's the reason that He came. So that He could save you. So Hebrews chapter 2, 14 and 15 shows us four reasons for Christmas. Because we're human. Right? I'm sure you have that. So that Christ could die so that he could destroy the devil and his power and so that he could free us from this lifelong fear of death he came to do that okay that's the reality of christmas and yet we're so worried about getting a perfect present that it consumes our whole season right you know christians the reason it's called Black Friday. Y'all don't care, do you? I can tell y'all are ready to go. You're done early today. It's called Black Friday because we all take money that we don't have to spend and buy all these good gifts because it's a savings. We waste the whole season wondering if we're going to get that perfect gift, right? I, mean, I told my wife, I told my mom and dad, I don't, I don't know how I ever get money perfect gift because he's got everything and so we start stressing out we being my sisters about it. what are we going to get daddy for Christmas we have no clue got everything he wants and if he wants it he buys it <laughs> so it's almost like it's uh, no reason to get him a Christmas gift because I mean he might like it and he might love it He wants. That's his right, man. We're consumed by sending everybody in our circle a Christmas card. And if they don't send me one, whoops, I'm sorry. I'm going to remember it next year and I won't be sending them a Christmas card. It doesn't happen at your house, I'm sure. Fido on the refrigerator. You want the dog on the Christmas card and you want to place it on your refrigerator and when it doesn't come until January you're a little ticked off about it. You're consumed by the dog not coming early enough. What about all these parties we have to attend? Charlie's got one to she does. This began. Look, look at the church in here. It's already started, man. We start doing Christmas like in November. And we're all consumed by where we have to go, what we have to cook, who's going to wear, do I wear, is Mama all going to be sweet today, and all of that stuff. And then something in my family will get mad because we do away with the traditional turkey and dressing that we end up throwing away because everybody won't eat it. And we have, and we're like, oh, that's not Christmas food. Says who? Right? I mean, you can eat anything you want to on Christmas. <laughs> I'm, you're, I'm, you're, you're free to do that, right? Now, if I get in trouble with some ladies, I'm sorry. I'm just be honest. But in all honesty, none of that has anything to do with Christmas if you read the Bible for all it's worth. And so when Granny's mad at you, or when your Daddy's mad at you, just go berean on them, pull out Hebrews 2, and say, here's what Christmas is about. It's about Jesus dying being buried, being ripped out of the grave so that he could destroy the devil and all his power so that we won't have to fear death for the rest of our lives on planet Earth. And now I'm going to have my sonic burger for Christmas. Okay, I'm going to ask you guys to stand and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Father, uh, we're really thankful that... Uh,
that this Christmas story has everything to do with the death of Jesus because in the death of Jesus we see a release from death for those folks who will believe in Him. So Father, we thank You that Jesus blazed a trail for us that we can follow. Father, I'm not saying that we can be perfect in this life, but I am saying we can receive Jesus by repenting of our sins. And we won't experience death like non-believers. Instead, we'll just see a transition. And Father, that means so many things for so many people. Because for some people, that transition needs to take place. Some folks are sick. Some folks are crippled. Some folks are disease-ridden. Some folks have an extremely difficult life. And the reality is, when death comes, all of that goes away. And it's only perfection. And so Lord, it's my prayer that you'll help us to see this morning. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. We're not here talking about some pagan idolatries. We're not here worried too much about a Christmas tree or anything like that. We're worried about the reality of what the text says. Jesus Christ was born to die. And in His death, we can have life eternally. That's what we're concerned with. Father, there's no way that one man can upset the traditions of man. But it's my prayer that You'll give us an opportunity to really know and understand and spread the real meaning of Christmas to all those that will be around this season. Father, there might be somebody here who needs Jesus. I pray that You'll save them now. Help them to see that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single person on planet earth. But you demonstrate your own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died on the cross for us. So 2,000 years ago, He knew what we would be involved in, and He still willingly and obediently went to the cross to die for that. Father, that's important because we know that the wages of sin is death as we've talked about in here today. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I pray that everyone in here knows God. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Father, I pray that you'll save some now in Christ's name.